Coming up next on KPBS Evening Edition, Governor Jerry Brown wants you to decide whether the rich should pay more in taxes to better fund schools. And the military has a new shade of green, and it's helping save the environment and save lives. KPBS Evening Edition starts now. Hello, thanks for joining us. I'm Joanne Farian. And I'm Dwayne Brown. It's going to be another cold night in San Diego. The Weather Service has issued a frost warning late tonight from the coast to the inland valleys. That's where temperatures could fall into the low 30s and upper 20s. Cold snap comes as San Diego's winter shelter for homeless adults put out an urgent call for blankets. Kids, too? Can no. come here? No? It's no, we'll, they'll, kids will come here. We send to the family shelter or okay. one of our... Um, permanent facilities. Yeah. This temporary city shelter is just blocks away from Petco Park downtown. Handicapped bathrooms, those are showers right there. This man drove miles from his home in the North County after hearing the need for blankets. He's getting a tour from someone who's worked with homeless people in San Diego for 25 years. So we normally have 50 women, all the women are up here. The cots that are in the middle aisles here are um, um, overflow. This is home to about 220 people. Most of them are senior citizens, disabled or recent military veterans. Some even have pets who need shelter. This is also a place to get clean and sober for at least 90 days. There's only 10 feet distance between where the men are and where the women are, and in 15 years we've never had one incidence of any kind of abuse, um, you know, any of that kind of nasty stuff. So as of yesterday, we were down to no blankets, and so we've got probably you know, maybe a hundred or so. I know once you get cold, your feet, your body gets cold, it's over. So if you have a wet blanket on you, not a good thing. So uh, yeah, I just woke up this morning still thinking about that. So I thought I'm gonna come down here. It's a beautiful day down here. And number one, I wanted to do that, donate some blankets for that reason, but also just check out what's down here. It's, it's like Bob said earlier, until you get down here and see what's down here, the sights, the smells, the people, and the reality of what's going on here. It's, uh, it's amazing. It's a wonderful, wonderful works they're doing down here for sure. More blankets are certainly needed. The chilly weather is expected to continue through the week. A new report says U.S. border officials wasted $69 million on steel they did not need for the border fence between the U.S. and Mexico. The inspector general for the Department of Homeland Security says project managers bought nearly 28 tons more steel than was needed, and then they had to pay to store the extra steel. Customs and Border Patrol was in charge of the project. The agency says it did make some mistakes, but Congress gave them short deadlines to build the fence. Officials say the extra steel will not go to waste. The San, San Diego took some preliminary steps today toward expanding the convention center. The city council voted to create a district where hotels could charge additional taxes to pay for most of the $520 million expansion. Downtown hotels would pay more, but hotel owners in spots like Mission Bay say they'd face an additional burden with little benefit. Hotel owners still have to vote on the issue. An initiative to reform San Diego's pension system is tentatively set for the June 5th primary ballot. The city council voted 5-3 for a June vote, despite arguments that it should be held until, no until November to save money. The council still could move the vote. Some council members say more voters will turn out in November. If passed, the measure would give 401k plans to new non-police employees instead of having them enroll in the current guaranteed benefit pension plan. San Diego Union Tribune has officially changed hands. Developer Doug Manchester and radio executive John Lynch took over today. The changing of the guard came with a change of the newspaper's masthead. It now includes the line, the world's greatest country and America's finest city. In a memo to the paper staff, the new owners say they want to create a far-reaching integrated media company, including a daily newspaper. California's governor is making a case for higher taxes. Joanne is talking about it with her guests at the Evening Edition Roundtable. Governor Jerry Brown is going directly to the people to ask you to support a tax increase. The governor filed an initiative yesterday with the Attorney General that would raise $7 billion a year. In a moment, we'll hear from two taxpayer groups, but first, take a look at what the governor is proposing. 
Governor Brown's plan calls for increasing income tax rates for the following individuals. Those earning between $250,000 and $300,000 would pay an extra 1% tax on income more than $250,000. Between $300,000 and $500,000, the increase is 1.5%. And over $500,000, taxes would increase by 2%. Sales tax for everyone would go up by half a cent. All of these increases would be temporary and expire by 2017. Joining me is Mirza Baksamusa, Secretary Treasurer of the Middle Class Taxpayers Association, and Chris Kate, Vice President of the San Diego County Taxpayers Association. Thank you both for being here. Thank you for having me. Let's begin with you, Mirza. Is this a good idea? Well, as you know, $10 billion in state uh, cuts have been made this year, significant, deep, painful cuts to our education system. 5,500 positions are being cut. Our schools are suffering. 25% cuts to a university. Our elderly are disabled. Every single social service provided by the state has been cut. There is little left to cut. So is this the best way to raise money for schools? I think the key problem here that the governor has addressed is that there has to be two sides of the balance, which is revenues and cuts. And he is proposing the other end through by going to the voters, just like the promise he made to the voters. Now, Chris, your group often tries to identify government waste, wasteful spending, and advocate advocate on behalf of the taxpayer. How do you see this this initiative? And let me be clear: we have not taken a position as the Taxpayers Association on this measure as of yet. And if it does get to the ballot, we will then do our analysis and take a position as is customary. Uh, the question becomes: when you're asking for more revenues, there are going to be some needs to show the voters that. Uh, the money is being spent appropriately, spent, is being spent wisely. What some initial concerns that we have regarding this proposal is that the need for more money and the tax increases aren't tied to any type of performance metrics or uh, guarantees to voters that the money is going to be spent appropriately, it's going to be spent wisely, and we're actually get some type of results from the investment we're making. We do know what it is going to be spent on, though. I know in the initiative language, um, the money will be spent um, actually mm -hmm. on schools and public safety. And in fact, there'll be an independent audit every year. Um, the money can't be spent on uh, spent on bureaucracy and administration. Is that a, isn't that a good enough guarantee? Actually, no. I mean, you're <laughs> going to, you want to see what the money is going for in regards to performance. I mean, they're usually um, you want to know if we're spending it on schools. It went to what schools and for what. As well, um, if we're at a certain level in regards to test scores, as an example, how is this going to bring up test, test scores? And if it doesn't, who are we going to hold accountable as voters? So if we spend more money on schools, do we necessarily get better educated students? Exactly. Mirza, we, we've seen, I mean, we've all seen now the, the momentum that the Occupy movement is gaining, right? The whole 99%, 1%. Do you think an initiative like this might be able to sort of ride on that momentum about income disparity? Because this really is taxing people in higher incomes. Absolutely. This is um, really the 2% on the 2% tax. And uh, it essentially harvests the crop that has come because of the success of California's educate, educated workforce in the last few years, uh, in the last few decades. As you know, the pact that Pat Brown had made regarding the state of the art education system in California is reaping its harvest today with some of the brightest minds, Nobel laureates in our education system. And that because of that innovation, entrepreneurship, we have some of the best um, Silicon Valley, some of the most innovative companies locating in California. Now going forward, we have seen a problem by which we are not investing in our education system. Now think about it, we're the eighth largest economy in the world if California were a nation. However, we rank on the 47th in terms of the spending per child in our education system, per capita spending in our K through 12 system. We rank essentially num the sixth bottom most in terms of our spending in community colleges. We have the highest 
teacher to student ratios in the nations, this does not behoove of the but, best education system. Despite all that, um, voters were asked just a year or so ago to um, uh, pay for even a parcel tax, which would go directly to schools, and they still rejected it. We know that in this state, if you want to raise taxes or create a new tax, you need two-thirds majority. Do you think, Chris, that voters, e even they hear this year to year, but they don't necessarily vote for a tax increase. Do you think something like this would get a two-thirds majority? I think it would be very difficult. Um, we saw what happened when the state tried to raise a tax in 2009 during the uh, beginning of the recession. Now we're in the middle of a recession and we're asking again uh, voters to go for a tax increase. We saw it last year with Proposition D with the city of San Diego. You mentioned the parcel tax for uh, the school district. Voters want to know that dollars are going to something that they can see and they can see the performance of it and the, the value of those dollars. Um, we don't get that with a lot of proposals to increase taxes. Uh, secondly, is it wise to be raising taxes in the middle of a recession? Uh, voters are very uh, protective of their pocketbooks when there is little to spend. Uh, part of the proposal by Governor Brown is a sales tax increase. Uh, sales tax increase is probably the most regressive form of taxation that we have. Uh, so that's going to be affecting everyone all the way down to the person who purchases a candy bar. Murchisad, we're talking about this, and he's introduced this at a time where we're entering mid-year cuts, and we have the largest school district in our county on the brink of insolvency. Do you think this might be good timing on the governor's part? Well, absolutely. I think up and down the state, people are seeing the impacts of the state budget cuts on their schools, their teachers, their classrooms, and seeing this education system suffer is really painful. What I think is important here to note is that people may not support the idea of taxes in general, but when it comes to education, Californians support education. Last few elections have shown that especially when money is tied to bond measures, for example, to, for our schools, people overwhelming come, come out and support it. We'll have to leave it there, but definitely we'll invite you both back to talk more about this. Murtaza Baksamusa and Chris Kate, thank you both very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anti-tax advocates have filed a measure of their own to limit government spending. Several taxpayer groups filed papers today. If both measures make the ballot, they could offer a stark choice for voters next year. You've heard of navy blue, but green is the color of today's navy. That story is coming up on KPBS Evening Edition. And the Chargers helped set a new record at Qualcomm Stadium today. We'll show you in just a moment. Your economy, your health, your environment, your country, and it's your choice for president. Need to Know, covering the issues that matter to you most. Watch Need to Know, Friday night at 8.30 on KPBS. Throughout its 50-year history, KPBS's news and public affairs programs have challenged conventional thinking. We're investigating issues before they reach a crisis. Our world is much more than just today's headlines, and KPBS helps all of us explore what's next so that we can take action now. How did Charles and Ray Eames become the most important husband and wife design team of the 20th century? The Eames chair. From furniture to filmmaking, they thought outside the box before anyone even knew there was a box. The concept is mind-blowing. Enjoy Eames on American Masters, December 19th at 10, only on KPBS. KPBS Evening Edition is made possible by Joan and Erwin Jacobs and by Welcome back to Evening Edition. San Diego State is expected to announce a football conference change tomorrow. The Union Tribune says the Aztecs will join the Big East Conference starting in July 2013. A switch would give SDSU a chance at more TV money and a bigger bowl game. Aztec basketball and other teams would likely move to the Big West Conference. San Diego Chargers haven't given fans much to smile about this season, but Boys and Girls Club leaders could smile about this team effort. The Chargers partnered with Kaiser Permanente to collect thousands of footballs, soccer balls, volleyballs, and more, all to be donated to schools and the Boys and Girls Clubs. A Kaiser spokesman says it's all about encouraging kids to exercise. 
With the budgets being cut over the last five years to our school districts, uh, they've cut the budgets almost 35% to the athletic program. So we really wanted to see what we could do to give back to the kids so they can go out and exercise and really be healthy. More than 6,800 balls of all kinds were collected over eight hours at Qualcomm today. It's going into the Guinness Book of World Records as the largest donation of sports balls. Dealing with the emotional effects of cancer can be overwhelming. Some patients don't want to burden family and friends with everyday fears and concerns revolving around treatment and their diagnosis. A lifeline to many of them are psychologists trained in cancer counseling. This is someone who can help them through their treatment process and also help in their transition to live after cancer. In our continuing series on cancer, KPBS reporter Peggy Pico joins us along with Dr. Wayne Bardell. Peggy is sharing her cancer journey with us. Dr. Bardwell is Associate Professor of Psychiatry at Moore's UCSD Cancer Center. Thank you both for being here. It's good to be here. Peggy, you. why why do you think it's so important, or how important was it for you to have someone to, to, to speak with throughout your treatment, um, throughout your diagnosis? To me, it was the most important thing. Uh, it was the first thing I did as soon as I was diagnosed, before I even knew who my oncologist was. Um, the reason being is, um, I look at uh, therapy as a, we talked about this kind of a little bit as as a as a, a personal trainer for your mind. You can exercise on your own. You can get through things on your own. But at, just in the same way that a physical trainer would help you build up your body, I knew I was going to need support and help uh, mentally through this journey. And it was very important uh, for me, it, particularly uh, on when it came to dealing with chemo. I would credit my therapist with being just as important, if not more, than my oncologist and my surgeon in, a, in a, enabling me to mentally get through the therapy. Dr. Baldwell, now you are a uh, cancer psychologist. How is that different from what we might just call a psychologist? Sure. Well, it's, uh, as uh, someone who works with cancer patients, I specialize in this kind of work. And in, in the process of working with cancer patients, you start learning more about the cancer treatment process, uh, the issues related to decision-making about treatment, uh, and some of the emotional issues that are specific to dealing with uh, cancer or some kind of an illness that could have uh, an impact on a person's uh, quality of life or length of life. So it's, uh, it really has become a specialty. Peggy mentioned her therapist help, helped her get through even chemo. Do you, do you see that a lot? Yes. You know, uh, uh, the active treatment process can be very challenging for people. And uh, even though the technology uh, of uh, the chemicals used in chemotherapy has come a, a long way uh, and other medications that are used for controlling symptoms, it still can be a challenging time. Uh, patients can face fatigue and insomnia. Uh, sometimes they just don't want to go and get their treatment. So uh, it's a challenging time, and part of my role is to help uh, keep that patient uh, involved in the treatment process and moving forward. Have you looked at whether or not having someone like this throughout your treatment actually affects your, your outcome, your prognosis? You know, it's, it's a very interesting area, and we don't have hard uh, data on that. Uh, but we do know that if people are struggling with severe distress, depression, anxiety, uh, fatigue, sometimes it affects their ability to actually continue with treatment. And certainly if someone doesn't adhere to their treatment, that can have an impact on uh, uh, outcomes. And there's some uh, very sketchy data. It's, uh, it's a bit weak, but still it suggests that if patients have been depressed in the past and they have a severe reactive depression after their cancer diagnosis, that it could have an impact on their length of life. So I think intervening is essential. Now, Peggy, there are several phases and stages that you may need help along the way. What about, so your treatment is done, uh, but you're living with, with cancer in the sense that your prognosis is good, but you have to deal with this so, sort of so-called new normal. Absolutely. It's the, it's, that's the transition I'm in right now, going from being uh, fighting the cancer and battling it to being a survivor. Uh, the new normal for me, which was a term I hadn't heard till I was diagnosed, um, cancer Im has impacted the way I look at, and most people say, life in general. I'm not the same person. My priorities are different. I don't look at life the same way. I'm not going to. I, I wonder, is it going to come back? When is it going to come back? Am I going to have to do that again? So the new normal is this whole soup of uh, new emotions and new thoughts that I'm, I'm learning how to integrate into my life. But the, the bottom line is life is never going to be the same. And so, um, 
you know, that, that would be the new normal. And, and it's like getting off a plane and a new destination. You're there, time to, you know, make a living and, you know, sort of make a home there. Well, Peggy, thanks so much for sharing your story once again. And Dr. Bardwell, thanks for being here. Thank you. Some Californians say they want another chance to vote on the state's multi-billion dollar high-speed rail plan. The story coming up in just a moment. This is KPBS Evening Edition. I'm Gwen Eichel on the next news hour, the debate over the new consumer watchdog agency. That's Tuesday on the PBS News Hour. Hi, I'm Elsa Sevilla. If you find yourself hearing about a great program on KPBS after it's already aired, we have a solution. Get notified about your favorite TV programs on KPBS before they air by subscribing to the TV Highlights email alert. This daily email will feature the best programs coming up right here on KPBS TV, so you can make a date to tune in or plan to record it. It's easy to register. Just go to kpbs.org slash alerts. The American people have named PBS the most trusted source of news and public affairs for the eighth year in a row. Trust. The American people have spoken. Thank you. The cost to fill up your gas tank in San Diego keeps going down. Gas prices are lower than they've been in nearly 10 months, but they're still up from a year ago. Regular unleaded now sells for an average of $3.63 a gallon. The auto club says lower demand is pushing prices down. California voters say they want a do-over on their high-speed rail vote. A new field poll shows 65% of Californians want a second vote. In 2008, voters approved the rail project for an estimated $40 billion price tag, but the latest estimates say the system would cost nearly $100 billion. U.S. military is the nation's biggest government consumer of energy, but the Navy is taking steps to reduce its need for fossil fuels. Joanne is talking about it with her guests over at the Evening Edition Roundtable. The Department of Defense is going green in a major way, and not just for environmental reasons. Reducing its reliance on fossil fuels can also save lives. Here to explain how is retired U.S. Army Colonel Dan Nolan. He is now CEO of Sabo6, a company that consults on alternative energy technologies with the Department of Defense. Colonel, thanks for being here. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Why is it so important right now for the, the military to go green? Well, I think there's become a recognition that our dependence on uh, fossil fuels uh, creates a vulnerability. So it's about energy security. That is assured access to the energy required for mission accomplishment. It's also a question of economics. Um, it's expensive to be profligate with your energy. And so the department's recognizing that and trying to not only save the dollars, but save the lives, especially in the forward operating areas. How'd you get involved in this? Well, it's interesting. After I was uh, after I retired from the, the Army, uh, I was working for a group in uh, Washington, D.C. area called the Army's Rapid Equipping Force. And they find uh, technology solutions to commanders' immediate battlefield needs, like um, detection devices for IEDs, robots, and those sorts of things. Well, they received a request from a Marine Corps Major General in the Anbar province of Iraq for a hybrid electric power station. Now, we'd never seen anything like that before, and as the strategic planner, I was asked to look at it. In doing the analysis, we well, I immediately thought, well, gosh, when did the Marines become Birkenstock wearing tree huggers? But the fact is, the most dangerous thing to do in the Anbar province was drive five gallons of diesel to a Syrian border site. His Marines were at risk because of the requirement to move fuel around the battlefield, and he wanted a solution. Why, Why are they so at risk, moving fuel around the battlefield? Are they targets of attack? When you're moving those large convoys of supplies, and it's fuel and water and food and ammunition, all the classes of supply get moved, you are at your most vulnerable. Because along those long paths, how do you protect yourself? How do you defend? That's why we uh, find the IED attacks, because that's where they're most vulnerable. And if you can find ways to reduce the supplies you're moving around the battlefield, the less vulnerable your soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines are. So you have to find ways to have a need for less fuel. 
I think a lot of us, when we think of military go going green, we've heard lots of stories in the past about even our own naval bases, solar panels, etc. But you're talking about something more than this, actually in the battlefield, using vehicles that require less fossil fuel, you, even ships that require less fossil fuel. Can you talk a little bit about those examples? The Navy has recently uh, sailed a uh, missile frigate um, that is a hybrid powered ship. So it uses diesel and electric. And on its maiden voyage, it saved the Navy $2 million. That's an awful lot of money on one voyage. And that recognition is now bleeding over into other aspects. At uh, installations around the country, uh, the military is buying electric vehicles to use on the bases. The Marine Corps sent a company into um, Afghanistan completely equipped with um, renewable energy systems so that they didn't have to have generators and fuel with them. They were able to recharge their batteries and that sort of thing um, using solar panels and, and other renewable sources. The Marine Corps spent $2.5 million to outfit this one company. They saw how effective it was and then spent $25 million to out, outfit all of their companies. The expected savings in a single year is $50 million for that one effort. Wow. The savings in life, priceless. You know, there are going to be people at home who see, can't help but sort of see the irony in this that I think um, fossil fuel oil tends to be the center of many conflicts around the world. And that here, if we have the military developing ways that we suddenly don't need this fossil fuel anymore, in a way contributes to peace in some way, too. I mean, there, you've got to see, sort of see that twist in the story. Well, absolutely. If you think what our Navy does is to protect the, the supply lines across the oceans. The Army is in places to create stability because we have to keep the engines of our, uh, our cars and our economy uh, operating. But if we can find ways to reduce that requirement, it's much less risk to those soldiers, sailors, air marines, but it's also less risk to the country. We send a billion dollars a day as a country overseas to purchase oil. What if we could keep more of that here? And some of that money falls in the hands of people who don't share our, our interests. Colonel Nolan, thank you so much for being here. My pleasure entirely, thank you. Welcome back to the Public Square on KPBS Evening Edition. Tonight, I'd like to know what you think of Governor Jerry Brown's plan to raise taxes on high income earners and increase sales tax by half a cent. Do you like the idea of being asked to decide at the ballot box? Already, we've been hearing from some of you on our website. Derek says, yes on raising taxes on the rich because it reduces income inequality. No on raising the sales tax because it's regressive and discourages commerce. Absurdist Wolf says, I support this, but this alone will not fix the problem. Giving the schools more money won't produce better schools. We need to raise taxes and cut spending. And then finally, Astrofan says, here we go again. We need to feed the Democrats' union taskmasters. We are in the top three states for income, sales, and car tax. Just say no. Well, let me know what you think. Follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, or cut out the middleman and just send me an email. jferian at kpbs.org. It's going to be a cold, cold night around San Diego County. Lows in the 20s and 30s. The Weather Service has issued a frost advisory for most of the county until 8 o'clock in the morning. You can watch and comment on any of the stories you saw tonight on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. Have a great night.